The word nihilism obviously comes from the Latin word nihil, which means nothing. Uh, it, one might describe it as the logical conclusion of what we know in milder forms as relativism, pluralism. It's, of course, strictly the belief that there is nothing. More particularly, the uh, belief that there is no absolute truth, uh, something that we're very familiar with in, as I say, its milder forms of pluralism and, uh, and, and rationalism. And, of course, it's very easy to point out the logical absurdity of this belief. Uh, that doesn't dispose of it because we believe a lot of logically absurd things. But um, I remember a friend telling me that he'd been on a plane with uh, somebody uh, with whom he got into conversation. And uh, at the end of the conversation, the other man said, well, of one thing I'm certain, there is no such thing as absolute truth. And my friend said, are you absolutely sure? <laughs> uh, it, it, it is, of course, logically absurd. Uh, but it, uh, that doesn't uh, dispose of it. Um, we have to ask, I think, uh, to look a little uh, at the ways in which we have come to this situation. <coughs> um, I'm awfully sorry, I'm finding it very hard. The light is not very good. Uh, the, I suppose the, the most influential figure in the development of contemporary nihilism is that of Friedrich Nietzsche, who saw that the way in which European thought was moving was bound to lead to the point where it would be impossible to say of anything, it is true, it is false, or of anything, it is good, it is bad, that there would only be the will, the will to power, and that the future would lie with the Übermensch, the superman, who has the courage to recognize that there is no such thing as right or wrong, and simply to exercise his will. Uh, and of course, that has had its spiritual results in such movements as the whole Nazi episode in Germany. But we have to ask how we reached this situation. Uh, I think we have to look at its origins in order to tackle it and find the cure for it. Let's face in the first instance, the first place, the fact that this is a product of our European Western civilization. For the last 200 years, our Western European civilization has dominated or has sought to dominate the world. We have dreamed of what was often called the coming world civilization, in which the civilization of Europe would take over the world and the world would become uh, shaped by the European um, idea. And of course what is striking about this 200 year period is that in contrast to the centuries that went before the concept of divine revelation was eliminated from public life. Uh, we know that from at least the time of what was called the Enlightenment, the Age of Reason, the concept of divine revelation could no longer function in public life. Of course, private people are free to believe in divine revelation if they wish to. But it is not considered appropriate in a parliamentary debate or in a discussion in a learned journal of economics or politics or literature 
to invoke divine revelation as a criterion of truth. Our civilization in the last 200 years, which has sought to become the world civilization, has eliminated the idea of divine revelation as a source of truth. And we have to ask why has that happened just here in this particular part of the world? And I think the answer again has to be and in that which our, we have prided ourselves above all things on which, uh, on which we have prided ourselves in these past 200 years of what we call the modern era, namely the so-called critical principle that all claims to truth must be subjected to critical examination. This has been the jewel in the crown of our Western modern scientific civilization. The critical principle that all claims to truth, however venerable, however deeply embedded in tradition, even if they come to us in the Bible or in some other sacred book, all are to be subjected to the critical principle. And of course, this is where the real issue arises. Because the critical, the critical faculty can only operate on the basis of beliefs which are held uncritically. When someone criticizes a position, a proposition, one has always to ask what are the assumptions which are not criticized when that critical move is made. If I make a statement and you say, I doubt it, I will say, why do you doubt it? And you will have to say, because I believe A, B, C, which contradict the statement that I have made. I can then, of course, turn around and criticize A, B, and C. I can only do so on the basis of something which I believe A, critically. The critical move, strange as it may seem, the elevation of doubt over faith, which has become normal in our society, has a conservative effect. People don't often realize that. People who make critical remarks are called radical. But in effect, what you will, if you examine the critical statements that are made, they are made on the basis of what everybody assumes to be true. And therefore they are profoundly conservative. What is obvious is that in all knowing, both faith and doubt are involved. We cannot begin to know anything except by believing something. <coughs> to put it off the other way around, if we doubt everything, we will never know anything. We have to begin by believing what our parents tell us. We have to begin at school by believing what our teachers tell us. You cannot begin by doubting. Of course, later on, you may come to criticize what you had hitherto accepted on faith, but you can only criticize on the basis of something else which you have learned by beginning with faith. So that while both faith and doubt are necessary elements, we cannot, we, we must exercise our critical faculties. We cannot believe everything we are told. But faith is primary and doubt is secondary. We can only doubt on the basis of faith in something which at that moment we do not doubt. And the consequence of, the, of that is, of course, that the critical principle must eventually destroy itself. And so it has turned out in the history of Europe that from the time of the great René Descartes, who with his critical method was the intellectual forerunner of our whole modern scientific worldview, it has necessarily followed that uh, the skepticism grows. It is always possible to criticize the grounds on which the critic has acted. And so you have the progressive movement of skepticism 
in our Western culture from Hume and Kant and Schleiermacher up to Nietzsche. Each of these represents a stage in the growth of, of skepticism. The great, the great philosopher of the Enlightenment, Immanuel Kant, taught that ultimate reality is unknowable, that we can only know the appearances of things, but that we cannot go beyond the appearances and know the ultimate reality. When Kant wrote these words, he also said that they would not do any damage because ordinary working men and women would never understand them. Um, but the trickle-down theory, which doesn't work in economics, does work <coughs> in philosophy. And it is now the commonplace of every man and woman on the street that we cannot know ultimate reality. That if we speak about God, it is only our opinion. And yet, of course, once again, one has to point out that there is a logical absurdity. Because in order to know that ultimate reality is unknowable, you would have to know what it is. One has to ask, how do you know that ultimate reality is unknowable? It is itself a truth claim. I was reminded of that vividly recently when I was challenged to a public debate by one of Don Cupid's disciples, who, of course, brought along his fan club with him. And um, he used the old Indian metaphor of the different roads up one mountain. He said that Christianity, Hinduism, Islam, Buddhism, and so on, are the different paths up the same mountain. And that when we get to the top, we shall all find that it was the same mountain. And I said to him, how do you know? How... What has given you this knowledge that enables you to know that Jesus and Muhammad and Shankara and the Buddha and Confucius were all wrong and that you are right? It's an astounding claim, and yet it is made with a mask of humility, uh, with a suggestion that it is a corrective to the arrogance of those who claim that the path they are following is the true one. How, again, we have to go a little farther back into history. How did European thought get to this position? I begin to answer that question by asking another one. What do we mean by the word Europe? We call Europe a separate continent, but of course it isn't. If you look at a map, it is obvious that Europe is only the western end of Asia. If you look at history, it is obvious that Europe is only the cul-de-sac into which the surplus population of Asia has been emptied millennium after millennium. Either from the point of view of geography or from the point of view of history, Europe is not a separate continent. Why do we regard it as a separate continent? The only answer to that can be that unlike the rest of Asia, Europe for a thousand years was shaped by a story, the story which is told in the Bible. Of course, not as a printed book in people's hands because there was no printing, there could not be. But because through the worship of the church, through its liturgy, through its prayers, its regular reading of the Bible in public, through the regular a cycle of the great Christian festivals in which the great truths of the gospel were set out season after season through the architecture, the art, the music, the drama, the popular festivals, through all these channels, these barbarian tribes that had overwhelmed the Roman Empire were shaped into a society which understood itself in terms of that story in terms of the story of, of, of God's mighty acts, so that one knew where we come from, where we are going to, and what the choices available to us are. For a thousand years, Europe was shaped by that story, and that is why we are a distinct continent, a distinct society. 
If we go back to the uh, roots of our European culture, we know, of course, that the, that the, the ancient classical world of Greece and Rome into which the gospel was launched was continuous with the life of Asia. If you have lived a long time in India, you immediately recognize that the philosophy, the legends, the theology, the myths of Greece and Rome are continuous with those of India. It is part of the same world. And the essence of that world view is that ultimate truth is timeless. It is not to be found in history. History is the transient. It is that which passes away. Therefore, it cannot be the place where you find final truth. Final truth is to be discovered by the use of human powers of observation and reason, by the contemplation of the philosopher, by the religious practices of the ascetic, so that the mind and the soul grasp some eternal reality which is beyond history, and history is the field of the transient. But we know also that in the midst of that classical world, there was another people, a strange people, present in the synagogues in every great city of that classical world, who had a different belief, who believed in contrast, in contradiction to the prevailing culture, that truth is to be found in a history, in a story, the story of the mighty acts of God, who had called and chosen a people, the people of Abraham, to be set apart as the bearers of God's purpose for the whole of humanity, as those who knew his law, and as those who would be punished and disciplined in order to become the place where God's reality is known. That contradiction of the prevailing view was the message preached in every synagogue throughout the ancient world. And we know also that when the events of the gospel, the coming of Jesus, the ministry, cross and resurrection of Jesus was brought into these synagogues and the story of Israel was, was, was brought to its fulfillment in these acts which we call the gospel, that there was then launched out into this pagan world a, a vision of reality in which the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob has become the God of all the nations and that the story of Israel is seen as the story of all the nations and that the old classical worldview is fundamentally challenged with a completely new view um, that the ultimate reality, the ultimate secret of eternal truth for which the Greeks gave many names, but one of them was the name Logos, the word, the reason, which ultimately, beyond history, is the locus of reliable truth. That this word has become flesh in the man Jesus Christ, whose ministry, death and resurrection is the manifestation of God's eternal being. Now, that created a profound crisis. The, 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 the ultimate reality is no longer something available to reason and to the mind of the philosopher. It is to be known by accepting and following the call of Jesus, that the answer to the question, what is the ultimate secret of the universe, is this man, Jesus. Now, uh, as you know, there were tremendous struggles in order to express this in the language of classical thought without allowing that language to suppress the truth of the gospel. And most of the great heresies that unfortunately we who are trained for the ministry have to study in our theological colleges and which are often extremely perplexing and boring. Um, they were essentially 
the struggles to prevent this message being smothered by the assumptions underlying all the great words that were used in classical thought. And it was the great Athanasius who saw clearly that this must be a new starting point, that if it is true that Almighty God has done those things which the Gospel tells us, then that cannot be fitted into any other way of looking at the world. It has to be, as he says, the new arche, the new starting point, the new datum, the new given reality, uh, and that everything else has to be built on that. You cannot fit it into any other philosophical system. As indeed our Lord himself says, and the New Testament says over and over again, Christ is either the stumbling block or the cornerstone. You cannot fit Christ like one brick into a building that is built on another plan. And so there was this, this crisis for classical culture. And it's most vividly seen, I think, in the man who stands at the frontier between the old classical world and the Christendom of Western Europe the great Augustine of Hippo. Augustine was a brilliant product of the old classical world, steeped in its learning, the professor of rhetoric at the Imperial University, a man who was the master of classical culture, torn between all of that on the one hand and the, the faith of his Christian mother on the other. And at the height of his spiritual struggle in that memorable moment, in the garden of the home where he was staying. There was a Bible on the table and he heard a child's voice singing the kind of little ditties that children sing. Tole legge, tole legge, tole legge, tole legge. Pick it up and read it, pick it up and read it, pick it up and read it. And he picked it up and read it. And that was the point at which he had to recognize a new starting point. And he used in his later writing the great phrase, credo ut intelligem, I believe in order to understand. In order to understand the world, I have to start here with this story. This is the point beyond which I cannot go, but from which I can explore and begin to understand the world. And that, of course, over the ensuing centuries, is what has shaped Europe into a coherent society with a different history from the history of Asia. But meanwhile, Greek rationalism had found another home. Islam, born in southwest Arabia where there were already Christian and Jewish congregations, when it swept through the ancient world, destroying the Christian civilization of North Africa and the Middle East and breaking right through into the heart of France, had already taken into its life the uh, classical uh, teachings of Aristotle and Euclid and Ptolemy and the rest of them. They had been translated by the Eastern Christians from Greek into Syriac and then from Syriac into Arabic. And Aristotelian rationalism became an integral part of Islamic theology. And when we come to the 12th century, Islam is a brilliant, powerful, rich civilization in comparison with Western Christendom, which is poor, backward, undeveloped. And when in the Spanish, in the Iberian Peninsula during the 10th and 11th centuries, the Arabic translations of the Greek classics and the Arabic commentaries on the Greek classics were translated into Latin, it made a tremendous impact on Western Europe. It is that impact which created the universities of Western Europe and which created the whole ferment of the late Middle Ages. And the question had to be faced, how do you relate this, what was called Nuova Scientia, the new science, the new knowledge, 
Remember that science is only another word for knowledge and it's only a modern use that confines the word science to a particular kind of knowledge. But here was a new way of understanding and the question was, how do you relate this to the biblical story? And the one who set out to answer that question was the great Thomas Aquinas who was writing books to help missionaries to go to the Muslims and bring the gospel to them. But in order to come to grips with this new way of understanding the world that had come in, Aquinas, as we often have to do, had to make some adjustment, some compromise. And he had to recognize that there are two modes of human knowing. Some things which we can understand by our reason and some things which we can only understand by revelation from God. Among the first was the existence of God, which Aquinas maintained could be known by reason. Among the others were the Incarnation, the Holy Trinity, the Atonement, and so forth. So that you see what Augustine had held together, I believe in order to understand. Faith is the way to knowing. Aquinas begins to pull apart. There are two ways of knowing, reason and faith. They are still knowing in Aquinas' teaching, but they are two different ways. So you begin to get that split between faith and reason. And that, of course, has dominated Western Europe ever since. But the first effect of it was also skepticism. Because if you have to bring in the help of the philosopher to undergird the claims of faith, then the arguments of the philosopher must be absolutely waterproof. From that time onwards until today, as you know, in Roman Catholic seminaries, there is a three-year course in philosophy before you come to theology. You have to lay a foundation of rational philosophy in order to undergird the claims of theology. But that means that the, the philosophy must be absolutely reliable. The proofs for the existence of God must be invulnerable. But of course they are not. They can be attacked, and they have been attacked and still are. And so skepticism began to be the prevailing mood of Europe until we come to the beginning of the 17th century when the great question discussed by the philosophers was can we escape from skepticism? And there was a great debate held on that subject in Paris in 1628 when a famous speaker addressed the meeting and claimed that there is an escape from skepticism because we can have probability and probability is sufficient. And the address was a great success and there was a standing ovation except for one young man who did not join in the applause. And uh, the Cardinal Archbishop of Paris who was there went over to ask this young man, why do you not applaud? And the young man whose name was René Descartes said, because if you follow my method you can have certainty. And as the result of that conversation, the Archbishop gave to Descartes a commission to prove, certainly, the existence of God. And Descartes, as we know, set to work to produce that proof. And as I say, he did it by separating decisively faith from reason. In order to achieve certainty, we must begin with something that cannot be doubted. And he began with the statement, I think, therefore I am. I cannot doubt my own existence. He then proceeded to build on that arguments which had the clarity and indubitability and certainty of mathematics and claimed that one could create a structure of proof that would give us a certain knowledge of God and of the world, and that any claim to truth must be subjected to the critical principle 
In other words, can it stand up to the rational argumentation of Descartes? And what cannot be so proved is not knowledge, it is belief. And so the way is opened up for the complete separation of faith and knowledge. So that uh, in the words of the great English philosopher John Locke, belief is a persuasion which falls short of knowledge. And that is where we are. Belief is a persuasion that falls short of knowledge. But as I have pointed out, the effect of Descartes' attempt to achieve absolute certainty has led us into nihilism. Because the very critical principle by which Descartes claimed to be able to achieve absolute certainty, a certainty which is not just faith but knowledge, that has led us right into the nihilism of Nietzsche and of the postmodernists of our own day. And that still remains with us. As I mentioned before, the theological training of Roman Catholic priests uh, up to the present day is still on the basis that there has to be a foundation of philosophy before you can come to theology. But the same is also true in some Protestant circles. If you take one of the great systematic theologies of the um, conservative evangelical school of Protestantism, Benjamin Warfield of Princeton, you find that there are five chapters of philosophical foundation before we come to Jesus Christ. And I had a vivid illustration of that in my own experience recently because during a conference when I was being challenged, I said that if someone asks me, how do you know that Jesus is the Lord and Savior whom we, conf whom we affirm? And if I were to answer, because A, B, C, I would have betrayed the faith because I would in effect be saying that A, B, C are more reliable than God's revelation in Jesus Christ. And I was then challenged by a theological professor who said, no, you, have, you can have certainty. There are, there are certainties which are available apart from faith in Jesus, context-independent certainties uh, upon which we can rely. So we don't have to just rely on faith. We can have certainty. And he gave as an illustration the principle of non-self-contradiction. If P is true, then not P is not true. The principle of non-self-contradiction. He said that is a context-independent certainty, quite apart from faith in Jesus Christ. But it was an unfortunate illustration for him to take, uh, because I've spent most of my life in India, and Indian philosophy denies the principle of non-self-contradiction. Indian, Indian philosophy says that both P and not P can be, both be true. And they regard the principle of non-self-contradiction as one of the weaknesses of Western philosophy. Where is the context-independent tribunal by which you could judge between Western philosophy and Indian philosophy? And moreover, if you ask, why is it? You, uh, do, are you with me? Do you know, you, you must have met people who have been uh, immersed in Indian thought who will tell you, you know, both sides are always true. You don't have to say yes or no. You can say both. If you ask why is it the case that the Western, that Europe has accepted the principle of non-self-contradiction, the answer is because Europe has been shaped for a thousand years by a book which tells us that God cannot contradict himself, that God is faithful, and that therefore there cannot be ultimate self-contradiction in the universe. So that the very principle which my conservative friend invoked was in fact itself an example of the fact that it is precisely the faith of the Bible which is fundamental 
And the idea that we can have a kind of philosophical basis which uh, relieves us of the necessity of personal faith and gives us a kind of certainty that does not depend on personal faith is an illusion. Now, when I say these kinds of things, I am accused of um, the terrible sin which is called fideism, or more popularly, an irrational leap of faith. Is it not irrational simply to say, I believe, uh, when I can't say, I know, with that kind of certainty that Descartes advocated? Am I just being subjective? This brings us to the crux of the whole problem. I am trying to show that it is this claim to have a kind of certainty that goes beyond faith which has led us into nihilism. The claim to have a kind of certainty which only God can have. The claim, in other words, to be like God. How do we answer the charge that faith is just an irrational leap. I think that there are two things to be said. The first is, to come back to my point at the very beginning, all philosophies of any kind and all science of any kind rests upon faith commitments which cannot be demonstrated to be true. I recently read a book uh, by an American philosopher uh, called The Myth of Religious Neutrality, who examines some of the great theories in physics, mathematics, and psychology, and shows how at the heart of every one of these theories there is a faith commitment. There is a decision that something is fundamental, something is basic, and on that assumption, the argument proceeds. And a moment's thought will remind us that no rational discourse is possible unless there are some things that we take for granted, some things which we agree. But of course those things can always be questioned. The idea that there is available to us a kind of truth that uh, is, is, is um, Beyond, that, that does not depend upon a faith commitment is an illusion. Uh, if the universe were a collection of things, then it would be true that by observation and reason it would be possible to find out what it is and how it works. But if the universe is, as we believe as Christians that it is, is the creation of a loving God, or to be more precise, that the love of the triune God, the love of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that endless ocean of joy and bliss, of love given and love enjoyed, has been spilled over in order to create a world which would be a theater of his glory and the human race who would voice the praise of creation. If that is true, then the only way to understand the universe would be to uh, respond in love and faith to the one whose universe it is. To assume that the only way to understand the universe is by the use of observation and reason, is to make an assumption which cannot be proved about the nature of the universe. If I may use a very simple and crude illustration, if you are walking along a road and see men at work and cement mixers turning round and bricks being piled up, you know that a building is going up. How do you discover what the building is going to be? Is it to be a church or a factory or an office or a home? There are two and only two ways to find out. One is to wait on the roadside until the building is complete and you can then by observation and reason discover what it is. It is a home. The other is, if you can't wait long enough, ask the builder. 
he must tell you and you will have to believe him. In other words, he has to reveal what his purpose is and you have to accept it by faith. There are no third possibilities. But if the building in question is not a house by the roadside, but this whole cosmos, the first alternative is not available. We shall not be around at the end. That if this whole cosmos has any purpose, then it is only by revelation from the one whose purpose it is, received in faith, that we can know what that purpose is. To exclude faith as the ground, the ultimate ground of knowing, is already to assume a certain belief about the universe which certainly cannot be proved. It is, of course, possible to say that when Jesus said to Peter, follow me, that Peter should have taken a course in philosophical theology before he decided whether to follow or not. It is not necessary to believe that. If the universe is indeed what we believe it to be, then the only way in which we may know is by faith. And the idea that there is available to us a kind of knowledge which is not dependent on faith is an illusion. It is that illusion which has led the modern European world into nihilism. The claim to a kind of certainty which is simply not available to us. Or to put it more precisely, I think, the claim that there is, as it were, a kind of spectator's gallery from which we can look down upon all the different world views and judge them from above, so to speak, is an illusion. There is no such gallery. We are on the ground floor with everybody else and we are called upon to commit ourselves in faith to the one who has called us, even though we cannot demonstrate from some other grounds that this is indeed the truth. I believe that the, for me, the most precious text in scripture which says what needs to be said is the text in 2 Timothy chapter 1. I know whom I have believed. I know the one I have believed. And I'm persuaded that he is able to keep that which he has committed to me against that day. Against which day? Against the day when I shall know as I am known. When the work of God is done and we will see face to face. Up till that time, it is by faith that we know. And the idea that there is some more reliable way to knowledge than faith is an illusion. We live in a world where we are called upon to take responsibility for our decisions. That there is the, the, terrible, the terrible error of Descartes which has shaped all our culture ever since was the idea that the human mind is a kind of disembodied eye which can look at the world from outside without being involved in it. The truth is that all our knowing of anything comes out of our bodily engagement with the world, our commitment to the world. And of course, the crucial question is that our commitment should be to the one who made the world and who has called us to be the true representatives of his praise in the midst of the world. The terrible error of nihilism arises from the illusion that we can have a kind of certainty that does not depend on faith. And so I would end simply by saying, how do we meet the challenge of nihilism? I think that there is both a negative task, we can, we can, we can laugh at them, we can show the absurdities which are involved 
in the nihilist faith. It is self-contradictory from beginning to end. But secondly, and much more positively, we can present Christ in all his glory and all his, 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 what is the word that I want? His grace, his beauty. We can present Christ and it is Christ in the end who alone can bring his own truth into the hearts of unbelieving men and women. Dear friends, I hope that wasn't too muddled. Uh, at any rate, I, I suggest we have a little time to to tell each other what a lot of nonsense that was, and then we can and then we can have some questions. Thank you very much indeed, Bishop. Um, before Bishop Newbigin began, he said he would like to do what he's just said, but to give you an opportunity for a few minutes to just uh, stand up, but not leave the room and turn around and talk to your neighbour. And I do hope that in a few minutes that will be followed by some questions and comments and challenges, and don't be afraid of that. Can we do that just for a few minutes, please? Gil. means There's lots of profound thought been going on, and, and you've got questions to put, and Bishop Newbing is very, very happy to... Uh, try and answer any questions you have, any points that you may not have been clear about, or indeed any just point you want to put. So I'm going to invite um, that. Uh, if I don't get some volunteers, I'll ask someone direct. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Bishop, would you just go back to the point about Islam and their philosophy re-infiltrating Western thought? I, I haven't known that in did you get the question? <laughs> just, just to, in a sense, repeat what you said about Islam and its impact upon the West. Sense. Yes, it's a fascinating story because um, you see, um, when the when the when the Arab armies rode out and conquered the world, they were totally illiterate, um, and the uh, they depended upon the Eastern Christians, because these, these, these were Christianized lands which they overran, they depended upon the learned Christians to be their teachers, to, 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 to um, run their administrations, so that Christians were the kind of uh, chancellors of the exchequer and the, and the, and the teachers uh, of, the, of the Muslims. And um, it was the, these Eastern Christians who translated the Greek classics into Arabic. And whereas Aristotle was almost forgotten in Western Europe up till about the 12th century um, and was, was never translated directly into Latin out of Greek, um, it, it, Aristotle got into Latin by translation from Greek into Syriac, from Syriac into Arabic, and from Arabic into Hebrew, and then from Hebrew into Latin. Um, it never got direct from Greek into Latin. Um, but the, the, the completely separate, the rational thought of Aristotle, um, especially expounded by the great Muslim commentators, Avicenna and Averroes particularly, when they were translated into Latin, they had a huge impact because it was a completely new way of looking at things. And, um, of course, with the enormous power of Islam, because, as I say, Islam was a much more powerful and much more highly developed civilization than Western Christendom was. You can imagine uh, the, the impact. Uh, as I said, this is, that is what created our universities. Uh, did you ever realize that the tassel on an academic hood comes from the Muslim fez? Uh, that's, that is its origin. It was, it was this immense Muslim influence that, that created uh, uh, these these new universities and for a time the teaching of Aristotle was banned in the University of Paris because it was thought to be so dangerous but obviously you can't uh, you, you can't stay with the thing like that and, and, and of course also Islam gave us mathematics um, without which the whole modern western world could not have developed you can't do modern mathematics with Roman numerals um, and, uh, and of course Islam also brought in 
um, the scientific medicine that they had inherited from the Greeks. So it, it had an enormous impact, and that's what created what we call the High Middle Ages. But as I say, which began this process of separating faith and reason as two different ways of knowing. But it's a fascinating story. It's one that I never was never taught at school or university or theological college, but it's vital for our understanding of the present human situation, especially as Islam is now challenging again so very powerfully our present culture. Yes. very interested in what you said about uh, the fact that criticism, that we can only criticize on the basis of faith, and particularly where you said that a child begins with faith in parents and teachers. Uh, I wondered how, if you could explain a little bit more, whether this applies to the situation where a young person comes comes to faith, comes to um, a commitment to Christ as his Lord, and sees the point of, of communion, the Lord's Supper, and of prayer together with other Christians. And then, some years later, sees this as very unimportant in his life, even though he still would say that Christ was his Lord. Um, how does he move on the basis of his faith to that doubt in what he believed in. Well, could I try to answer that in two parts? I mean, I, the first part, really, to restate what I said. Um, I remember listening to a Chinese Christian theologian saying how, how strong he felt the contrast between his way of coming to the truth and the European way. As he said, for us, the, the first step is just the marvel of truth, opening our minds to the greatness and wonder of the world. That's the first step in knowing um, for us. Uh, and uh, he, he said, on, by contrast, it seems to me that you in the West are primarily concerned to make sure that you don't get any, uh, that nothing slips past your guard, so to speak, which... Uh, can close great areas of truth to us. So I do very strongly affirm that in any kind of knowing of any subject, whatever, apart from, I'm not talking just about faith in God, but about any human knowing, that faith is primary and doubt is secondary. But now if we take the specific case that you uh, raise, well, it can happen in different ways. It can happen because of the enormous pressure of what the sociologists call the plausibility structure. It's not easy to go on believing something which everybody all around you denies. Um, it does take courage, and um, we, we all know that in our own experience. But there is also the enormous power of, um, <laughs> apart from the kind of intellectual um, pressure of uh, public opinion, there is the enormous power of our consumer society, which is simply bent on personal uh, gratification, instant gratification, which appeals to very powerful elements in our nature. And it is very easy to be seduced. Uh, surely this is something that, uh, that certainly the Bible teaches and that we all know that it is very easy to be seduced from our true allegiance. Um, it, 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 it's, it's, um, but, but uh, in, in, in terms of the kind of intellectual debate that goes on in our society, I do think it's so important when people write, for example, if I may refer to um, the, the, the book of my friend John Hick called The Myth of Christ Incarnate, um, I don't know whether people read that, but it was very influential, The Myth of Christ Incarnate. Now, that book presupposes an idea of God which would make it impossible to think of God becoming flesh in Jesus Christ. And therefore, Hick 
dismisses the idea of the incarnation as impossible. But I have to ask the question, where did he get that idea of God from? And what are the grounds for that belief? I do not believe in the God whom Hick writes about in that book. Um, but, 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 but uh, or, or again, if, if, um, if one takes uh, for the, 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 the denial of the resurrection, again you have to ask, on, uh, what is it that is not being doubted when you say, I cannot believe in the resurrection? What is not being doubted is a certain view of the world as a closed system of cause and effect, which, which, is, uh, which, is, which is a total explanation of the world. Now, that whole conception of the world has been and can be very radically called in question. But when a, a theologian says, I can't believe in the resurrection, you have to ask, what are the things that he does believe in which makes it impossible for him to believe in the resurrection, and what are the grounds for those beliefs? Uh, it, it, one always has to reverse the question, I think. But I, I'm not sure whether I'm answering your point. I think you're raising a different point. I namely, it's the point about the need for, for God's people. The need for yes. Fellowship. The, and, for, I mean, and the need for faithfulness. I mean, all of us are tempted. Uh, we, 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 are, we are weak. We are tempted. We need the fellowship of the church and we need God's help to remain faithful when there is so much that is seeking to seduce us all the time. The, the doubt of that, it bothers me, the doubt in young people that that is necessary, that bothers me. I, I, I didn't catch it's, the last... It's the, the way in which young people come to doubt that they need that. Yes, yes. That interests me. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes. <laughs> I absolutely agree with your comments regarding the triple down in philosophy, and in particular the way the others and the perhaps especially young people, lean on from what's been said, and in particular perhaps subcultural groups as well. But the way that Nietzsche has been taken or reappropriated now by deconstructionists like Derrida, do you think there's any... What you were saying about the need to always challenge the basis of every assumption, do you think there's any sort of validity at all in the form of Christian deconstruction based on that? Christian deconstruction. In a, in a funny way, the, the postmodernists like Derrida can be allies. Um, as you know, one of the most famous remarks of the Enlightenment, which in a sense summed it all up, was the remark of Lessing accidental happenings of history cannot prove eternal truths of reason, um, which marginalized the Bible, because the Bible is happenings in history. And therefore, instead of the Bible telling us what is the truth, we subject the Bible to critical analysis on the basis of the eternal truths of reason, as we understand them. Now, what Nietzsche and, uh, and those who have followed him have done is to say these so-called eternal truths of reason are in fact accidental products of history. Um, uh, G Nietzsche's book, The Genealogy of Morals, claims to show that the so-called moral absolutes are just products of historical development. And Foucault, The Archaeology of the Social Sciences, again, the same thing. So that in their negative um, aspect, the deconstructionists are, in a sense, are they're, they're deconstructing something which we do not accept, namely the idea that there is a structure of, of, of sheer reason which can enable us to form a coherent picture of the world. Um, what we have to deny, of course, is when they say that, these, that none of these stories is true, we have to say there is a story which is true, and that is the story of God's mighty acts in creation and redemption. Um, so that there is one sense in which, uh, uh, which uh, one, I, I mean, I think Derrida himself defined post-modernity as a skepticism in regard to all meta-narratives. 
Now, the Bible is a meta-narrative. It does claim to be the story within which all other stories can only be properly understood. So we can share Derrida's skepticism in regard to the meta-narrative of the Enlightenment, uh, the, the meta-narrative of progress, of civilization. We can share his skepticism, but we have to affirm that there is a meta-narrative which is the true story. But the curious thing is that the trust themselves back on faith because they are like all the fundamentals behind that sort of enlightenment view uh, away. So that although they don't admit it, they are clinging to a form of faith themselves. They don't know what in because they deconstruct everything that comes along. But, but nevertheless, there is opportunity there. Yes, yes. I think that, um, but that, that, that goes back to the, to the self-contradiction of nihilism, doesn't it? Or am I, is it a different point that you're making? No, I, I think that, that's, that's wrong. Hmm. I mean, it, it's, it, the fact is that you have to believe in revelation. If you don't believe yeah. in revelation, yeah. then nothing else makes sense. At least people yeah. come to that. And if, and if there is no revelation, there is no way of saying what is the purpose of things. And if there is no way of saying what is the purpose of things, there is no way of saying good or bad, because the thing may be good for one purpose, but bad for another. I, I like to tell the story of uh, something that happened when I was a boy. There was a big scout jamboree at Anfield Park in Liverpool, and about the same time, something called shredded wheat had been invented. Um, and uh, on one day in the camp, um, shredded wheat was issued as rations to all the scouts and there was a complaint at the office uh, later in the morning from the Nigerian scouts. These pan scrubbers are no good. <laughs> um, if you don't know what a thing is for, there is no way by which you can use the words good or bad. If you don't know what a human being is for, there is no way in which you can say some conduct is good, some conduct is bad. You can only uh, describe the conduct and, and produce a sociological analysis of the conduct, but there's no way in which you can say good or bad, and that is exactly what Nietzsche saw. I never did like shredded wheat myself. <laughs> Mike has a question over there. <laughs> I want to make sure if you could uh, add to your comments about Islam. Um, is there any philosophical reason why Islam is increasing uh, in, uh, in influence uh, as over Christianity uh, seemingly at the moment. Is there anything we can learn from what you were saying happened in the 13th and 14th century? I think that the, the, the main issue that we're going to have to face in the 21st century is the challenge of Islam. Because Islam sees quite clearly that our Western secular civilization has become simply a pagan, uh, a pagan culture with no moral absolutes at all. Uh, the, the Muslims see that, and they have a very clear agenda. And as you know, young Muslims especially uh, are, are very, very active on our university campuses today and in the uh, in all and all areas of public life. I read some time ago a book which was put out by the Islamic Institute of Leicester and then withdrawn. But it is the agenda for the capture of power in Europe by Islam, uh, not primarily by individual conversions, although that's part of it, but by securing the positions of power in the educational system, in, in government, in the economic order, and so forth. Islam has a very clear agenda. And um, I, I think that they are perfectly right when they say that um, the, our present uh, Western culture is simply morally bankrupt, uh, that it has no way in which it can deal with its moral problems um, because, for the reasons that we were talking about. I, I mean, because without divine revelation, ultimately, there are no solid grounds on which you can talk about good and bad. And the, the Muslims see that. Uh, um, I, I, I pray that we may not become an Islamic society, but I think we have got to take the cha their challenge very, very seriously and ask the question. 
and this raises the huge questions, what does it mean to work for a Christian society? I think we have to face that issue. What does it mean to work for a Christian society? And, and very briefly, uh, am I talking too long? Not at all. Um, I, I mean, the great issue between Christianity and Islam is the question of how is God vindicated? That is the great question of the Psalms, isn't it? How shall God be vindicated? How shall God's holiness be manifest in a world full of evil? That's the basic question of the, of the, of the Psalms. The Muslim answer to this can be expressed in a, in a very simple story form, and so can the Christian. When Muhammad's message was rejected in Mecca, and he fled to Medina, the Hajira, and there he brought the people of Medina to his faith, ra raised an army, and went out and conquered the city of Mecca with the sword, and then set out with the sword to conquer the world and very nearly did. The Christian answer to the question, how is God vindicated, is when Jesus rode into Jerusalem, not to conquer, but to die. And that when he rose again, he was giving us the different concept of God's vindication. And to put it as simply as possible, the cross is God's judgment of the world. If the cross were the last word, then the world is finished. It has no future. The world is at enmity with God. The resurrection, which is a fact like the cross, but not a public fact like the cross. The resurrection is a fact entrusted to a chosen company of those prepared for it. Because if the vindication were a public act, like the humiliation. That would be the end of the world. There would be no more time for repentance. But because the vindication is given in the resurrection of Jesus from the dead as a, a secret entrusted to those prepared to receive it, to be communicated to the whole world with the message that there is time for repentance, a time of grace given for repentance, but that the final reality with which all will have to deal is the Lord Jesus Christ who will come to judge the living and the dead. That's the difference between the two ways of vindication. For Islam, there must be vindication in this world. Islam must rule, must conquer. For Christianity, for the gospel, God will be vindicated at the end, that is certain. But within history he is giving us time to repent. That means that whereas Muslims cannot allow um, religious dissent, they cannot allow uh, other faiths to have an equal status with Islam, Christianity, while affirming the truth of the gospel, is required by the gospel itself to give freedom for dissent, because that is the nature of the, of, of the gospel. The tragedy of our time is surely this, that up till the time of the religious wars, Christendom did not allow religious freedom anywhere. The religious wars sickened Europe of religion and led to the acceptance of the Enlightenment, which provided religious freedom, but on a wrong basis, religious freedom on the basis of the belief that God is not the reality of public life. We have to do something entirely fresh now in our coming generations, do something we've never done before, and that is affirm the gospel as public truth, and because of the gospel, give the freedom to dissent, which Christ gave to the world when he went to the cross. Now, how to work this out in practice? I think is the great task for us in the coming few generations.